Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. Uh, these first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. Uh, the What Is Money show is 100% sponsor Based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, uh, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc., so what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, uh, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Max Kaiser, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Yeah, it's fabulous to be here. And finally, we get together and we have this conversation and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, it's been quite a while since we last spoke. Um, I think I saw you in person in Miami. And yes, we were in Miami and I was actually interviewing you at that time. Yes. I remember that fondly. Yeah, yeah, I remember that as well. And then I think we did, before that, I was on your show. So this is your, your first appearance on my show. And I, yes. yeah, just thrilled to have you here. Um, So you, you're a man who needs little to no introduction, but uh, I guess I would just say, You've been called the high priest of Bitcoin. I guess that makes Stacy the fairy godmother of Bitcoin. I saw that on her Twitter bio. Is that yes. her adopted slogan? Stacy is the fairy godmother of Bitcoin. That's correct. Okay. Very nice. Um, and you recently released a book called The Book of Max. Can you tell us just a little bit about what that is and what that's about? Right. The Book of Max is a collection of all the... Uh, Interesting, insightful things I've said over the years about Bitcoin. You know, I've been in Bitcoin since 2011, since it was a dollar. And, uh, you know, we you get into the philosophy of Bitcoin and the metaphysics of Bitcoin a lot. And so um, I've done my share of contributing uh, to, to that as well. So we try to capture them all. Like, you don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you, right? Mm. And it has a lot of the artwork that um and memes that people have done over the years this is uh l brandon who's uh, our favorite uh bit artist in the in the meme space who likes to come up with funny max and stacy images here's stacy the fairy godmother that's so beautiful mm -hmm. and um so you can get this on amazon for the low low price of i think 13 i don't know what it is eight dollars i'm not sure Nice. Awesome. So it's just a lot of the the maxims or aphorisms you've been dropping over the past 11 some odd years as it relates to Bitcoin. Yeah. Just all the wisdom of Max condensed into one little book. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. People who get into Bitcoin, eventually they become me metaphysicists and they get into <laughs> the metaphysical aspect of Bitcoin. And all roads lead to a metaphysical, meta, 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 philosophical 
aspects to it. And um, this is where it all goes ultimately. Like Michael Saylor, he started off as an engineer, then he became like a prophet of metaphysics. And um, this is all that happens uh, quite frequently. Unless you take the dark side, unless you become you know, an alt coiner or shit coiner, you know, mm -hmm. then you go down a different path toward uh, the hell essentially. And that's the, the, those are the two paths on offer. You have either you ascend to the metaphysical heaven or you descend into the analog basement of reality somewhere in Satan's playpen. Well, that I'm glad you said that because I've actually been reading books on metaphysics recently, and I, I guess it is, it does have to do with Bitcoin, frankly. I've been trying to figure out um, all these terms that we throw around, you know, we're trying to use language to describe a complex reality, and Bitcoin takes you down that path to ultimate questions, I suppose. And I guess when you start dealing with ultimate questions, you're in the, the domain of metaphysics. Um, it's okay. So, I, I didn't plan on getting here first, but I guess I should go ahead and ask you about it. It's on your Twitter page. You said you're going down the quantum mysticism rabbit hole. Is that in any way related to this metaphysical um, relationship or the metaphysical, I guess, questions that Bitcoin gives you? Well, I just discovered this uh, yesterday, quantum um, metaphysics, quantum um, journeys. Uh, yes. Um, good, good, good. A friend of mine was tweeting about it. So I just got into it right away and started uh, looking at it. And um, apparently there's a whole um, uh, body of knowledge uh, exploring this idea that essentially humans attract. It's a power of attraction. And you, mm -hmm. if you think thing, you know, certain things that have, you can uh, will them into existence. And um, when you think about Bitcoin, I think B Bitcoin was willed into existence because mm -hmm. humanity was searching for perfect money and mm -hmm. the internet came around and it created this global unconscious and global conscious. And within that global unconscious, the need for perfect money began to take form mm -hmm. and the cypherpunks who were hacking away, trying to create something like internet money for 20 years, uh, kept at it and the memes were flowing and the ideas mm -hmm. were flowing. And then finally in 2009, it dropped. I, I do make a bit of a joke by saying that the SETI at Home project, which was in the 90s, where a lot of the distributed uh, computer network application was designed to capture radio frequencies from outer space to search for intelligent life. And anyone could download that program. And I did it myself when I was uh, on the internet back in the 90s. And I joke kind of that the Bitcoin idea for the Bitcoin protocol kind of seeped in uh, mm -hmm. from alien intelligence and uh, percolated into the cypherpunk's brain. So it comes from alien intelligence and, it's, and, it, and it leaked into our domain through the SETI at home project. And uh, that un global unconscious was stirred and uh, thoughts were had. And then the question is, is Bitcoin created or was it discovered? I think for me, it was discovered. It was something that was always there since the beginning of the universe. And we finally discovered it and uh, we now are in the age of Bitcoin. And of course, in El Salvador here, we're in the age of Bukele, where uh, President Bukele has made Bitcoin legal tender. And we see what happens in the country when a president embraces Bitcoin, understands Bitcoin, is fully orange-pilled, and understands the applications of it and how it relates to society at large and how it relates to culture. And so that's why we feel privileged to be living here, because we're now living the orange pill life uh, in El Salvador. And um, so I think that brings us up to date. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, I've it, I've been thinking about like the, the market process a little bit. It's almost like a search algorithm in that people are trading with one another, working, trying to find the best tool for the job. And you know, money obviously is like one of the, one of, if not the most important tool in the world, it's as if that whole market process or, or capitalistic process was trying to zero in on what is the best money, right? We, and gold was historically the, the best approximation of good money. But um, I guess in that way, you could say Bitcoin is, I mean, I've argued this too in my writing that it's more of a discovery, at least the 
I don't know. I said Bitcoin's an invention, but absolute scarcity is a discovery, almost like um, conservation laws and physics. You know, we don't really invent those. We fig we discover them basically in reality and we start building our systems around it. So um, right. it's fascinating how Bitcoin just confounds language when you really get get to the the edge of it, I suppose. It does confound language. You know, language is a very crude form of communication, actually. Mm -hmm. So the abstraction of thoughts into ability to manipulate our throat and our mouth and our tongue and our to create little bursts of sound into mm -hmm. syllables and into words and into syntactical logical sequences. You know, it's, um, it's by the time the thought kind of makes it out of your mouth, it's highly abstracted. And then it goes into another extremely abstract place called somebody else's brain, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a, a, a warren of, uh, emotions and chemicals and experiences and perceptions, and it gets processed. And then it goes into something called consciousness. And then that person will respond to what you just said, using the same kind of wonky, faulty, mechanical engineering of the mouth and throat and back. And you go back and forth like this. And I think most communication absolutely fails. You know, you see instinct in the animal kingdom works a lot better, right? So when bees are at the beehive making honey, they're not actually talking to each other per se, are they? They're emitting, I don't know if bees emit pheromones, but they are dancing. They are all mm. nonverbal. It's all instinctual. And um, it all seems to, uh, to add up to something that we call the ecology. I think with, um, with words and, and Bitcoin, what I focus on is less about, let's say, markets and pricing markets in units of money. I think, and I think more in terms of price discovery. Mm. So for me, price discovery is, is really the most fascinating part of markets. And it's the process wherein players in the market come together and they decide on an, an equally beneficial, mutually acceptable price, uh, despite coming to that uh, process, coming to that interaction with wildly different disparate expectations and backgrounds and that that price is agreed upon and um the goal for me i think would be perfect price discovery which would be absolutely frictionless price discovery for example uh photosynthesis to me is frictionless price discovery it's uh, mm. you know plants are turning uh into oxygen um carbon into oxygen essentially on the photosynthetic behavior of the green leaf and that's a perfect market. It's a frictionless market that you could say. Mm -hmm. And um, I think with Bitcoin, with perfect money, it brings you to a place where we can experience those types of perfect markets intercommunally with each other. Um, and I think we're seeing the rise of that. I think that would represent the Bitcoin singularity. You know, mm -hmm. when our, our uh, global unconscious kind of joins and, and goes through the portal, into mm -hmm. this place where all thoughts are overlapping perfectly and we're having a certain z epiphany and mm -hmm. rapturous union with Satoshi. I think that's what mm -hmm. Bitcoin ultimately takes us to. The idea of money and property and wealth actually gets disintermediated completely and you end up with just a state of being, which is um, what has been intuited by mystics and shamans and religious folks for eons from the beginning of time there's always been this idea that we can enter a space of sh shamanistic space of union with the mystical and i mm. think bitcoin is a way for us to get there by collapsing all price discovery to zero and by unifying our collective unconscious in a way that takes us through the bitcoin singularity portal Hmm. Okay, so that's uh, <laughs> my answer to that question. <laughs> Lay it back a few times, folks, if you didn't get that on the first take. Uh, believe it or not, I would like to go a little bit deeper on that, actually. So I love this notion of price discovery being the most, it is the most important function of markets, really, right? We're trying to figure out how do we put these resources to their highest and best use? And you have to 
basically index that against what people want and what is available. And that is where you get the price, right? That's how we figure that out. Um, you know, you're a man that worked on wall street. There's that saying price is truth, right? There's, there's a lot of, a lot of potency in that statement. I think that, um, whatever an asset is trading at that, that does represent its worth in the world, right? The, the commodities, the, an appraisal of the commodities value, let's say, obviously not a measurement because value is subjective. Now, so price discovery, very important. Some maybe almost like a truth discovery process. We need it to continue to adapt and increase living standards, et cetera. Now you said this to me in person in Miami, I think this was two years ago. And I think you were perhaps just alluding to it that on the other side of hyper Bitcoinization was a revolution in human consciousness. Do you have um, specific surrounding? Like, what do you actually see happening that uh, we, we move into a, a post scarcity type world and then everything changes, including our own moral software? Or like, well, what does that actually look like? And what do you mean when you say that this, that Bitcoin could, and, and correct me where I'm wrong. I thought you said basically Bitcoin would usher in a revolution in human consciousness. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, an accurate um, kind of um, a, a memory of, of what I said. So if you think about consciousness, it was more or less discovered by Sigmund Freud and uh, in the 1800s. And so he developed concepts of the conscious, the subconscious and the unconscious. And and um, that was a revolution in consciousness, and it was a revolution in um, the medical field, obviously, and to probe people's subconscious mind and unconscious mind for um, path for origins of uh, illness or um, origins of um, aberrant behavior or how to, uh, of course, uh, at the same time, Carl Jung um, was working uh, in similar field and came up with uh, things like the synchronicity and the mandala and um, ideas of, of uh, the hero uh, journey that uh, we are all basically repeating certain templates of behavior and we have certain relationship with history that compels us to interact similarly throughout history and that culture tends to reflect this and we see the same um, totems and uh, um, stories emerge uh, throughout history as a reflection mm -hmm. of our conscious and our unconscious. And, and so with Bitcoin um, is another deeper probe into what would be the collective unconscious, which is a Jungian term, um, which is where I take it from. And so this would be a, a further uh, probe into this psychological dimension and with as we're saying when you have perfect price discovery and perfect money and you essentially algebraically solve for want right because most markets are driven by want people want stuff and so that's reflected in price discovery but when you remove want from the equation and you just have pure interactions based on the ebb and flow of nature, you know, the, the tides, the moons, the human interaction, this is all very cyclical and natural and, and reflects a deeper consciousness that we have with a creator or the creator, I guess you, you know, I don't could, uh, could say that. And so Bitcoin takes us to that place. So it's a revolution in human consciousness in that way. Mm. I think in El Salvador is an interesting example of making Bitcoin legal tender and adopting Bitcoin and being orange pilled and having President Bukele speak so eloquently about Bitcoin for so long. You know, he was tweeting about it in 2014 and began in 2017. He's really been in Bitcoin for a long time. He's thought about it a great deal. And one of the side effects, and I'm not going to claim that there's a direct cause and effect here, but I will allude to this. Mm. You know, one of the side effects of a Bitcoin consciousness is a certain intolerance of violence and a certain intolerance of, of um, kind of uh, social uh, injustice. Mm. And, um, you know, in the last year, we've seen in this country, the uh, violence uh, decrease uh, almost uh, 
you know, over 95%. So El Salvador went from being the most violent country in the region and one of the most violent countries in the world to being the safest country in the region and on track to have a safety and a security record better than Canada, right? You know, people wow. think about Canada as being a pretty safe place. Well, El Salvador is on the, its way to becoming even safer than Canada. And I think that's a, a big a correlation with, with the Bitcoin because Bitcoin, again, on that subconscious, unconscious, universal conscious level, changes you. And as I mm -hmm. say in my book, the book of Max, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes <laughs> you, right? So once you allow the protocol to come into your mind, it'll either do one of two things. Either you become a, a malevolent, dastardly, no good Nick, <laughs> like a Sam Bankman Freed, uh -huh. or you're elevated, you know, it takes you to a place that you want to be, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, as they say here, and that could be, for example, uh, a President Bukele, or I think uh, Michael Saylor is somebody who I think was elevated. You know, he had already, uh, you know, I've met with him a couple of times. I know you have, mm -hmm. and he has a real passion for education mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and and I know that he is happy that um, he's found a, an audience of folks that he can pull into his sphere of what what he's passionate about and mm -hmm. i know that these something like education is something that's near to his heart mm -hmm. and um so this again the bitcoin experience accentuates that and it and it and, it, and it's accentuated in the at that conscious level and the consciousness layer in the stack of humanity you know is a fairly new discovery right i mean we mm -hmm. this is this is fairly new here. We're just only, you know, 150, 160 years old. We're talking mm -hmm. about the discovery of the, the unconscious mind. And of course that can also be used in a malevolent way. You know, Freud's, uh, was a cousin or somebody, you know, he used it, uh, Edward Bernays, you know, to mm -hmm. use uh, subconscious persuasion in marketing. And, um, this has been a catastrophe in many ways, you know, mm -hmm. they, for example, in his day, they convinced women that to be truly free, they should smoke cigarettes, right? Because mm -hmm. they had, uh, they figured out that they weren't, they had a whole market of, for cigarettes, women, and they, they needed to get that market. And so they, he launched this uh, campaign of subliminal, subconscious kind of um, using Freud's uh, uh, work to, to, uh, involuntarily get people to, to act in ways that were against the, their, their best interests. Hmm. And so that's something we still, we still deal with. Um, we have an economy right now called the nudge economy where, where we're, we're constantly every single day bombarded with hundreds of thousands of messages from marketers mm -hmm. who are nudging us on a subliminal subconscious, unconscious level to do things that are not in our best interest. When I was a kid, subliminal advertising was against the law. You know, they used to put advertisements of Coca-Cola during the movie to get, or I'm, I'm sorry, salty, but it's just salty stuff in the movie to get you to go buy a Coca-Cola, right? And they, mm -hmm. it's a subliminal image and you know, that they outlawed that. But over time, this has been completely obliterated by by the hyper presence of social media where we're actually our minds are semi-connected to the internet and we have yeah. no defense against this type of subliminal um, nudging and marketing and the results are in many ways catastrophic it's a led to complete social uh, cohesion nightmare where you have social confusion let's call it that social confusion yeah. where you have now um whole demographics of the population are very confused about who they are, what they are, where they are. And I think that's just the direct result of rogue uh, social media engineers who are preying on mm. the subconscious in ways that are, in my view, completely abhorrent. But uh, it's something that, you know, I think uh, Bitcoin is here to help us navigate away from that. Yeah, agreed. Uh to outsiders, this is a, a difficult leap to make, perhaps. Like to your point, consciousness is relatively new in our in human discourse, right? Just the concept of consciousness. Um, I've it seems or it feels like maybe through the emergence of Bitcoin, we're discovering how impactful money is on consciousness, actually. That they seem 
money is a tool that we use to scale human consciousness, perhaps. Uh, again, back to the price signal, right? You can get a whole lot of data in one little price that lets the human consciousness interact with the market, which the market is just all the other, all the rest of human consciousness in the world. So, and you can't have that that bridge between the individual and the, the collective market process without money. So um, let me ask you, so you, so yeah, Carl Jung, alchemy, this sounds almost like the philosopher's stone a little bit we, that was mm -hmm. prophesied for a long time that we would uh, discover, or I guess we would discover in nature, in the laboratory of nature, we would find redemption was kind of the premise of the philosopher's stone, that we could find some incorruptible substance that would serve as an antidote to tyranny. And, you know, we could wax philosophical about this, but it is very interesting to me that Bitcoin does seem to be incorruptible, at least in its supply cap, right? No one knows how to change that or break that. Um, and you mentioned earlier, so all of this to me, like the namesake of the show, obviously it begs the question, well, what is this money stuff we're talking about? Like if it's so impactful on human consciousness, it's necessary for truth discovery. Perhaps it's going to usher in this revolution, you know, towards uh, of human consciousness, let's say. Earlier, you described photosynthesis as a perfect market. So what in your mind is serving as money in the perfect market of photosynthesis? And I'm trying to back into the question here to you, which is what is money ultimately, but I'd like to understand, I'm trying to look at money through a non-economic lens, a more ontological lens, let's say. So that's why I ask you, you know, what in your opinion is the money of the perfect market that you call photosynthesis? Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. 
Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. I think that's, it brings us to the conversation about art. Mm -hmm. So what makes art and what makes beauty? And so what makes Mona Lisa the most viewed masterpiece in the world? Something like 20 or 30,000 people look at the Mona Lisa every single day in the Louvre. What is it about that assembly of lines and colors and that, that was done is so powerful because it, it completely, there's an absence of any um, intermediation between what the artist is saying and what the person viewing the artist is hearing. So the artist is reaching out. I mean, it's the Mona Lisa is a great example because her eyes follow you around the room. Hmm. You know, people who see it will tell you this. That's the artist looking at you. Hmm. And there's nothing between the artist and you. Their art is the perfect lens to capture that moment. Hmm. And so money is effectively, if it's doing its job well, we're completely unaware of it. Hmm. And I think money's origins go back to human's quest to move. I think humans uh, uniquely of all animals need to explore and to explore means you're moving out of where you were born and you're moving into places that you are unfamiliar with. And the easiest way to do that is to have something that you can trade with because, mm. um, if you just show up unannounced and nobody knows who you are, they're going to stick a sword in your eyeball and you're going to be dead. But if there's a knowledge out there that, Hey, you know what, uh, there in this area, the people who polish stones to a very high degree and we use them as jewelry, they're sought after. And before we kill this guy, let's see if he has any of those polished stones that talk about, you know, we, we can trade with them. Um, and of course, it, it, it does also encourage bad behavior as well, but I'm just, you, you're traveling through time with something that you can use as a medium of exchange, mm. which uh, is, is money. And over time that has evolved from various different types and forms to give humans the ability to be mobile and to interact with other human beings. Humans are desperately lonely in this mm. universe because we have brains that are way beyond our ability to use them. And so we get lost in our own minds and we need other people around to avoid going insane. And the, the way to do that is to simply interact with other humans. And the way to do that is you've got to get off your ass and move and you've got to travel. And to do that, you need to, to trade with something mm -hmm. and to, to, to get food, to find out where, the, to get information. I mean, this is where mm -hmm. money and information, the parallels come because you're using your money, your exchangeable good to get the information you need to find out, well, well how do I get some water? How do I get, wh where am I? You know? Mm -hmm. So then this evolves into this information network over, you know, a hundred thousand years or more specifically over the past five to 10,000 years, over the past few hundred years, obviously the gold had be has become the number one, um, money because it has great attributes if you're somebody traveling around and you need a medium of exchange in, in a way that it gives you the ability to travel through time because gold's purchasing power due to its scarcity remains constant. Mm -hmm. And um, it allows you to travel through space because it's, it's somewhat portable, mm -hmm. it's divisible, it's fungible. So with gold, you have the ability to be free, to, to walk mm -hmm. anywhere. I think you can go anywhere in the world. If I have gold, they'll take it. Mm -hmm. That's the great thing about gold. Um, you know, flash forward to Bitcoin, Bitcoin does everything that gold and money we expect it to do, except it does it better. It does it in the digital age. It's more secure. It's more portable, uh, everything that we talk about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin represents the, the long search for perfect money mm. in that sense. And as a result, it has caused massive, uh, nervous, um, neurological problems in people who are incapable of handling this idea of perfect mm -hmm. money. Again, so you have someone like a, a Sam, Sam Bankman Freed who looks at the quote unquote crypto market and becomes the biggest crook in history. Mm -hmm. uh, be, and then you have somebody uh, like a 
Michael Saylor or a President Bukele who looks at it and says, you know, this is actually a way to help en or engineer our our lives and our economy in ways that are going to benefit everybody, right? So, mm. so it has this. This is where we're at now with Bitcoin. It's cleaving the society. Um, I, I don't like to throw in biblical references uh, really because it's contentious and everybody throws a fit. <laughs> but nevertheless, the literature in various religious uh, religions is uh, outstanding at times. And you learn a lot from reading books like the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Jesus talked about was the path narrows, mm -hmm. right? People are saying, you know, why, why is it, why is it getting harder and harder for me to get into heaven? Jesus, you know, shouldn't <laughs> it be wide open and we can all just disco our way in. He's like, no, no, actually the path narrows, you know, you huh. have to, once you start a virtuous path, you have to, practice your virtue and become even more virtuous there's no today's virtue doesn't uh doesn't work tomorrow you have to be virtuous every day and right. so with bitcoin similarly once you get the bitcoin meme and once it's in your mind and it's kicking around and rearranging your brain it it, uh, it doesn't stop you don't wake up tomorrow and like well that bitcoin thing was interesting but i'm i'm gonna start crocheting now and making puppets for dogs you know yeah. now it's still working in your brain whether you want it or not right. so um therefore um the point is that uh there's we're at a, i think we're at a point where there's no turning back you know for for humanity um not to be overly dramatic uh but um i think that given the current state of affairs around the world and with the fiat money machine now going into hyperbolic overdrive and all the excesses that were brought on by fiat money all of the you know the malinvestments that are mm -hmm. in, 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 um, made possible through the money printers has created a dystopian nightmare a and um so this is sadly for the zoomers the Gen Z's out there, I feel kind of bad for them mm. because they're walking into the buzzsaw of probably the worst financial social disaster in a thousand years. You know, for, for us boomers, we're like, oh, well, you know, we had a great 40 years, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, but for uh, the Zoomers and, and the millennials, though, it's, uh, it's a dire situation, you know, so I would encourage the younger generations, you know, load up on Bitcoin because that is definitely a way to create a bulwark against what I perceive to be a growing um, cascade of interlocking and, and reinforcing problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliantly said. Um, you have a tweet, I think that captures a lot of what we're talking about here. I'll just read it real quick. You wrote that Bitcoin is perfect price discovery and perfect money. It's the ultimate truth machine that reveals to us who we really are. For Sam Bankman Freed, it revealed his inherent malevolence. For El Salvador, President Bukele, it reveals his inherent goodness and benev benevolence. Now, I agree with you on that. that. It's interesting how Bitcoin holds up a mirror to us in a way. Um, and helps us see things about ourselves that we might may not otherwise. It's a very interesting, interesting that it's just a technology, but it does seem to have this psychological re reflective thing going on. So there's that. I think it's but there's, because. Mm -hmm. so, oh, sorry. Just to complete it. There's that aspect to it, but then there's this other aspect of like the attributes of good money seem to be inherited by the users in a way, right? Like if you do embrace Bitcoin, you can go from being a you know deceptive political violent fiat maxi or you know whatever flavor of that you are and become something more like bitcoin maximalist that's more honest productive peaceful like i've experienced some of this transformation in my own life just getting into bitcoin is making me want to be better in ways that i i hadn't previously identified what is going on there what is this phenomenon of the money changing us and Bitcoin even more so, I guess, because it's unchangeable. Yeah, I get back to a discussion about art. So I think one of the underappreciated aspects of Bitcoin would be that it's aesthetically stunning. 
So mm-hmm. it's like the Sistine Chapel of money. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, and when you see works of art that are transformative, they move you deeply mm-hmm. and they can change mm-hmm. your life. Um, and it can happen at any moment. And um, I think with the Bitcoin protocol, it is aesthetically stunning and it, it has that transformative ability to, to change uh, it, it, that. That's what it is. It's uh, I wrote it down a couple of notes here and well, uh, you know, beauty has a different impact on different people. You know, beauty can, can uh, also uh, as a mirror, it can, some people would be calmed by beauty. Mm. Some people are outraged by beauty. Mm. Again, it, it, it depends on your psychological profile at the beginning. And that's contingent upon a myriad of variables. Mm. But for some folks, when they are, when they're confronted or when they see beauty, they react hostile, hostily. Mm. Others would re- react more in a way that is uh, transcendent for them that they mm. would they would have a moment of um, uh, of, a, of aesthetic satisfaction let's call mm. it so um that that's that's i think at the kernel of the bitcoin protocol and why it has this ability to be a magic mirror and bring out the mm. best and the worst in us um you know i was stacy and i were traveling in mexico city a few years ago and we stumbled into this art exhibit really spontaneously it had just it was actually held at their bank. It might've been one of their central banks. They had an art exhibit in, in the actual building. And I saw something there that I think about almost every other day. I think about this. And this is a moment of aesthetic transformation where I saw a work of art. The artist spoke to me completely directly with no intermediation whatsoever. The artist was in my brain and rearranging furniture involuntarily. Mm-hmm. I had no choice in the matter. Mm-hmm. I simply saw the world differently. And so it was an installation piece. It was it was a piece where you have a set of stairs that are going down facing a mirror and on the, on the top of the staircase, you had people and then, um, subsequent steps down the stairs, presumably the afterlife, you know, the, these people would become who they truly are. Mm -hmm. So one person's became a, 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 a tomato, uh, one person became a monster. One person became an angel mm-hmm. and, and they see themselves in the mirror. So it's very clear that they're being they're the self-reflection in the mirror of their moment of, let's say the moment of death, mm-hmm. which, uh, brought about the ultimate confrontation with oneself mm-hmm. revealed in the mirror who they really are. And I think Bitcoin does that because it has aesthetic qualities that resonate deeply mm-hmm. in our souls and in our imagination and in our consciousness and our collective unconscious that are involuntary, spontaneous, overwhelming, and transformative. And it happens all day long. You know, people, mm-hmm. if you open your mind to the universe, it's a kaleidoscope of intense colors and sh- shapes and sounds, you know, but it's overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of artists go insane because they are too open with the universe and they get, get burnt essentially. Yeah, you know, it's hard right, to find right. a filter. You want to be open, but if you can, you know, you, you never look directly into the sun because right? <laughs> right, right. you'll fry you. Uh, and, but if this is a, this is a conundrum artists have because mm. They know that that's where the best art is by looking right into the sun, but yeah. they also know that it'll kill them. So, um, and this is why this is the, this is the typical conundrum of the artist. So, um, you know, I've played with it my whole life. I've avoided it, played with it, danced around it. And it's been a struggle actually, because I know in my quietest moments by myself, just thinking about the universe, it can be overwhelming. So I have to, kind of, um, be aware of that yeah. and, um, stay focused. And Bitcoin is a way to stay focused because it's, um, the engineering is so, is so beautiful and the, the incentive model is so perfectly balanced and, um, it can be, it, it'll bring you peace. You know, Bitcoin is peace. Bitcoin is peace. Bitcoin is love. And if you open yourself to the protocol, it, it can heal you. 
If you are unsettled, if you're imbalanced, if you're uh, in pain, if you open yourself to the aesthetic beauty of Bitcoin, it will heal you. It will heal you. You'll be healed. You'll be healed. It's all in this book right here on Amazon for $9.99. You too can be healed, brother. <laughs> Promise we're not crazy. Um, no, I, I the the relationship between madness and creativity is a well-taken point, right? We've seen a lot of artists fly too close to the proverbial sun and they get burnt up. And we've seen a lot of, what is the, the, the club of 27 year olds, right? Like Kurt Cobain and Amy Winehouse, right, yeah. like they're artists. Jimi that, Hendrix. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix. They, I guess they just looked into the sun, right. For the, for the good art, but it actually, they destroy themselves yeah. in the process. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I'll tell you one interesting actor, you know, stories with Marlon Brando. I think he did, um, when he did, um, 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 tang last tango in Paris. I think that he, he dug so deep into his artistic oeuvre that he, from there on out, he was gone. He's just like, his eyes were spent and he went, you know, like you see that sometimes in artists, the lights go out, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They, mm -hmm. they, they, they tripped the light. Fantastic. One too many times, mm -hmm. but, um, nevertheless, um, this is again, you know, it's, it's, if you're going to live and you have to live fully, um, it's just an interesting, I mean, we're all going through a separate experience. Uh, the Bitcoin is a great unifying, uh, thing for all people and humanity yeah. because it solves a lot of things. You can travel with it. I can go anywhere in the world now with Bitcoin and I can use it. I can get to place point A to point B it, um, I have a store of wealth, uh, that's, that's inflation proof. So I, mm -hmm gives me some sense of property and self-sovereignty. It's, uh, it's obviously growing quite rapidly. The adoption is growing. Level two is growing. Um, countries like El Salvador are making it legal tender. So I, I, I think this is what the great story in the 2023, 2024 is going to be a lot of people just moving to El Salvador right. because um, they want to live in a country that respects happiness, pursuit of happiness, property, individual sovereignty with a president who is absolutely perfectly happy just doing stuff that the you'd want your president to do build infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, take, take uh, reform pensions so that they mm. make sense. Like he just does common sense stuff, but it, and we live in a world where common mm. sense is seen as an, an unbelievable radical. act of revolution. You know, like, <laughs> what's he doing? He's doing like common sense stuff. Okay. On yes. top of that, he, he is also a very dynamic leader and he's inspiring and he has um, great ability to, to talk and to, uh, you know, I, I hearken back to uh, John F. Kennedy, you know, who famously, mm -hmm ask people to think about what they could do for their country. Mm. Uh, and it, it gave rise to the Peace Corps and it gave rise to a whole youth, as they used to call it, movement, um, which uh, was was unique, really, for, the, mm -hmm. I think, the past 50 or 60 or 70 years. I don't think we've seen really anything like that. Um, so there's there's certainly that element to it. So, But people are going to be moving here. I think, th I yeah. think there's gonna, just going to be a huge wave of people. If, if 80 or 90,000 people are going to go to, um, you know, a festival in the desert in the middle of nowhere. Um, I forget the name of that, that festival. Burning Man. Uh, Burning Man. Yeah. Like think about 80,000 people go to Burning Man mm -hmm. to get three or four days worth of consciousness raising human experience. Well, yeah. why not just move to El Salvador and have that every day of your life for the rest <laughs> of your life? You know, you don't need to go to Burning Man. Just move here. This is the perpetual Burning Man. That is the sales pitch, I think, for El Salvador right there. Permanent burning, Burning Could Man. Be. This permanent Burning Man right here at El Salvador. <laughs> you know, for 200 bucks, you can just, you're here. <laughs> um, I love this. I haven't thought about Bitcoin in this way through the, the lens of art, but um, one thing I have thought about is like we, each individual is their own masterpiece in a way, right? That's what we're all doing. We're alive, creating our lives. That is you can't not be an artist in that way, right? You have to create yourself. Um, so Bitcoin maybe is something that really empowers that process of self-authorship or self-creation um, just by giving you 
just by liberating you from the actions of others or oppression of the state or whatever your use case is. So that's fascinating to me. Um, okay. I want to talk about El Salvador. So you have you taken up residence there? And then I've seen on your profile, um, I don't know if this is you tweeting or someone else, but they described El Salvador as the financial center for hyper Bitcoinization. I know there are some volcano bonds being issued, some uh, reform to El Salvador's digital securities laws, I think for consumer protection related to shit coins and things like that. Like it all sounded really good. Um, National Bitcoin Security Office, I know you are, you're instrumental in a lot of this. So could you just, I mean, you've already given us the ultimate sales pitch for El Salvador, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what's, what's going on down there from a, uh, a legal standpoint. Uh, yeah, we're a residence here, uh, Max and Stacy, and so we, you know, picked up and we we live here, and um, so it's um, there's a lot of folks that are working to not only make Bitcoin legal tender, which was done uh, by the president in September of 2021, but to also bring in some additional legal parameters and frameworks to allow for a securities industry to, to grow, which would be on top of a Bitcoin. So it's a Bitcoin foundation with uh, Bitcoin securities on top. And that law actually was just passed today. So the historic day, uh, mm -hmm. the Bitcoin, the new securities law uh, just passed today. So this is uh, a moment where all of the, all of the momentum and the goodwill of making Bitcoin legal tender is now carried into the, the securities um, markets uh, as we know them. Uh, additionally, the law stipulates pretty much what um, has been said by others, but no one's really acted on it. And that is that Bitcoin is money. Everything else has to be, ha you have to be considered as potentially a security. They have to go mm. see the securities regulator. Mm. So this is what Jay Powell has said. And a few other people have said, not Jay Powell, but a couple of other people have said this. Oh yeah. Gary Gensler. So, um, this is now law. This is now the case. So they, um, President Bukele has really taken the, the the first mover advantage once again, not only making Bitcoin legal tender, but introducing these new security law that makes this differentiation between Bitcoin and everything else. So this mm -hmm. will minimize, if not eliminate, the presence of all the bad actors and the shit coins that really yeah. have no place to anywhere, really. They're not, we, one thing I think people are coming to realize in the end of 2022 and 2023 is that there was no use case for any of these shit coins. They were only mm -hmm. there to steal your Bitcoin or to bamboozle people. There's mm -hmm. no point in any of them. And, and so now uh, with this legal framework in place, there's a way to, uh, to, to, to make that clear. Uh, then there'll be, I guess, an equivalent of an SEC type of organization that will be um, actually drafting more formally the, the laws around that. Then there's a Bitcoin office, which is um, designed pretty much to uh, be a, 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 a point person, if you will, the point where um, the, the interaction between anyone coming into the country, uh, mm -hmm. they would have a place to uh, interact and, and get the get up to speed quickly in terms of is this the, is, is this the place I should be, or maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't be. And uh, so that's in place. And um, so a couple of other um, pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Um, yeah. I'm, um, uh, you know, offering my help in any way I can. Uh, Stacy, my wife is really uh, made this uh, in a big part of her life and she's really made it a mission to, just do absolutely exhaustive kind of 360 degree breakdown of every possible uh, aspect to how Bitcoin would interact in this economy and, and try to create ways to make it as smooth as possible and make it as scalable as possible. And, um, you know, the great things are happening. So, um, so that's kind of where we are with, formalizing and, and pushing forward different parts of this, of, of the, the Bitcoin agenda. And of course, it's all inspired by the president who has mm -hmm. really gotten, I think, people to think outside of their comfort zone and think about, you know what, how do we make uh, orange pill country? How do we make the Bitcoin citadel nation? Mm -hmm. What do we want? You know, how do we do it? And so that's what we're doing. Wow. It's amazing. What, 
for people that might be interested in taking that leap and leaving the U S or wherever they are and moving to El Salvador full time and contributing to this bright orange future, do you have advice or recommendations? Like what, if you're, you know, I don't know, a young 20 something right now working a fiat job, ready to dive in to the Bitcoin movement and move to El Salvador, like what advice would you give an individual like that? Well, I don't know when this airs, but I, we have a party here on January 30th in El Zante, okay. which is Bitcoin Beach. Uh, so I would recommend anybody to come visit for a few days or a couple of weeks. That's the first thing to do yeah. and get a, get a feeling for and, and just see for yourself what's going on. See how you feel. Uh, if, in fact, you decide, you know what, I want to migrate there. I want to move to El Salvador. Um, you know, that may that might be the, the choice that you make. And it's you know, it's, it's not that hard and it's getting easier all the time. Um, it's the people here are phenomenally friendly and they're really happy to see folks come and, and, uh, join in with the effort to kind of build this, uh, Shangri-La or this, mm. uh, kind of, uh, you know, country where people are really pulling together. And, um, so I think they'll find that refreshing mm. and, um, you, you know, when you go back to the States, sometimes it's a culture shock because it's the, the fo- people are just strung out, <laughs> you, know, <they're> <laughs> bad shape, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to even take, you know, going down a st- street in San Francisco or something, and it's just completely bizarro, um, hellish, yeah. uh, you, you know, it's, it's almost unbelievable. And, and, and so you just, you don't have that feeling here really. It's, uh, mm-hmm especially now with the crime and violence has been dropped by 95, 96% and continues to drop. Amazing. Well, I'm super excited to visit myself. Uh, I may even make it down for your party. Um, We will air this soon before your party. So hopefully people that are listening um, can get down there as well. Where, if they want to find out more about that, where should they go? Uh, Well, you can go to uh, Orange Pill Party is a handle on Twitter and uh, that will help you find uh, hotel rooms and uh, other like-minded folks. You know, we have an orange pill telegram group, which is t.me forward slash orange pill. That's probably the best resource people can have to find Mm. out who's doing what. And there's a lot of people get prepping to go down to this party and stuff. So that's probably the best way to do it. T.me forward slash orange pill is the telegram group. And then the uh, orange pill party, uh, Twitter handle. And, um, those are two, probably the two best ways to get started on your trip here. <laughs> trip. The orange pill is a trip. That is for sure. It's a trip. Well, the weather is incredible. The Pacific ocean is warm. The surf is great. It's a really great time. It's on, it's, you know, I think, um, one of the big tourist magazines this year made El Salvador, their number one t- destination un- wow. undiscovered, you know, it's, uh, um, it's just, it's, you can't believe it. The beaches are fantastic. The waves are great. And they're not, they're not busy. Uh, they're not crowded yet. It's, you're yeah. still undiscovered. Wow. So cool. Mm. Wow. Well, Max, um, I mean, thank you for everything you've done in Bitcoin. Like you, you've been at it for a long time and you continue to open people's eyes, myself included to, to new aspects of this movement and just really grateful to have you. Um, is there anywhere else that people should anywhere else people should find you on the internet? No, I usually hang out on Twitter, Max Kaiser on Twitter and orange pill. Uh, we have our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash orange pill. And we're ramping up the orange pill machine right now. Well, after this is over, we're going to be cranking out yet another episode of the exciting orange pill experience with Max and Stacy probing the nether regions of orange pill mania <laughs> and El Salvadorian cultural freakishness all <laughs> in one show. I mean, it's got it all, Robert. It's the show of shows. That sounds super freaking exciting. Max, I really appreciate you coming on and I uh, look forward to seeing you again, hopefully down in El Salvador. Come on down, Robert. You know, you're more than welcome <laughs> to come on down and I uh, would love to see you down here. Uh, bring a bathing suit and uh, hang out. Could do some surfing. Sounds good to me. I'll see you down there soon. All righty. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, we'll just do it again sometime soon, I hope.